It's the Endo meeting on October 4th. We have demos and announcements. Uh, ZB and Leo are talking about React Native uh, and uh, interactions between Cess's Lockdown and the Hermes engine. And then we have Pet Demon demos. These should be fun uh, from, from Dan and Aaron. Yeah, OK. So I'll try to be real quick about this. Uh, we have uh, Lockdown running uh, for React Native uh, under uh, JS Core uh, engine, so the, the one that powers Safari, among other things. Uh, and that's uh, that's already working pretty much ready to ship as soon as the mobile team comes back from their uh, from their um, meeting. <clears throat> And then uh, we tried with Hermes, the new engine uh, that React Native shipped, shipped with uh, over a year ago. And that new engine um, is uh, optimized for running JavaScript for the sake of React Native on mobile. Um, and it's lacking a few things. Uh, so eval is one of those things, uh, but I think we already mentioned that. So we don't have means to run uh, compartments yet, but we hoped to run just lockdown. The problem is um, it also doesn't support async await syntax. So yeah, and, we ran into some errors, yeah, regarding yeah. that. Yeah. And it wouldn't well, what, even what attempt for... running our code. <laughs> What version of JavaScript does it claim to 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 support? Uh, it claims to support uh, most of uh, ES six. I think that's the wording. ES six, okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, but uh, it's not complete. They're they're not passing all of the tests, and uh, the coverage is lacking. They Re introduced proxies very recently. We didn't have and, a chance to test them out yet. And you said that do not support async await. Uh, yes, the uh, so the the React Native setup refuses to uh, even attempt to run code that includes uh, async functions. So what you're looking at on the screen, if we could zoom in a bit more for people at home, uh, there's four errors. Uh, and all of those uh, are about async functions. These are async functions in the compartment. So my first uh, attempt was to uh, build a copy of uh, uh, lockdown UMDJS that doesn't contain any code uh, for the compartment, which uh, wasn't uh, uh, trivial, but could be done. Uh, but then lockdown itself is grabbing prototypes of async generator function instance. And that's enough to trip up uh, the compiler here or or whatever happens there. So unfortunately, uh, if we want to run under Hermes, we would need to either wait for them to finish uh, the work on async await uh, or refactor back to promises, which I, I looked at this code and refactoring it back to promises is going to be very difficult. I mean, we can generate the code without the uh, without grabbing the async generator, but yeah, that's, that's gonna be hard. So oh, to, to cut I, to what? the solution, I'm... Uh, I'm planning to try uh, to build a fairly simple uh, JS code shift script. So in other words, a code mode uh, that would be able to take build unminified uh, SAS and remove the things that trip up um, Hermes without damaging uh, the lockdown functionality. So there are two things that we could do here. Now that we have vetted shims, we're in a position where we can start to refactor Cess to be a stack of shims. Um, and it should be noted that the import machinery of the compartment could be a shim 
on top of an evaluator compartment, in which case you wouldn't need any of the module machinery at all. Mm -hmm. It's also true that I am suspicious that I don't think it, I don't think it should be particularly difficult to refactor the module loader to not need async await. Um, well, even if we do, we need async for async generator function instance. Yeah, so that's another thing I think Matthew had on his eye in the past. There is an issue somewhere about supporting uh, evalless environments and failing safe. There's an issue somewhere about uh, these cases and handling, like failing safe uh, if something doesn't execute and, and, and not relying automatically on async uh, in incest itself. It seems to me that there's a bit of a tension there that we either are able to feature detect async uh, the existence of the async intrinsics, which would require eval. It's like CES does not depend on having async syntax support, but we do depend on the ability to detect the presence of an async, of the async prototypes, like the async function constructor. Yeah. Uh, right. You would need, you would need uh, eval for that. Yeah. If you don't have eval and you don't have uh, that async, then there is no way. Well, I mean, technically, there isn't. The, the problem is detecting, right? The problem is detecting uh, if you are, if CES has been uh, uh, rewritten, uh, if it's been compiled. Uh, what, are, what are the announced Hermes plans on when they expect to have production support for async await? Uh, they do not post deadlines. It's an open source project that is uh, held by Facebook, uh, but it's not a uh, full team working on it. I think it's okay. more yeah. like an open source project than like an internal project with a PM. So we've been in conversations, especially about the with statement support because that's also missing and we uh, really want to have it. Mm. All we know is that uh, they're declaring that async await is a work in progress. So on the listing of missing features of JavaScript, async await is in the in progress section, not in the planned section. Okay. So I, I can also say are also in progress, which uh, suggests that this is um, a long deadline. Yeah, as um, empirically, um, I've opened non-conformance bugs against Hermes, and they take an extremely long time uh, to get attention and fixes. So I would expect the same is true of feature development. Uh, Ricardo's hand has been up for a while. Uh, yeah, I yeah, uh, I just wanted to say that I've been testing the eval for the different uh, function constructors, so like uh, for uh, the async constructor, for example, as uh, means of doing feature detection, and that seems to be working fine. And uh, I also think that it's a good idea to do that because in in, in the future there might be like some new type of uh, uh, function constructor that uh, will take a while to roll out to other uh, engines. So it's a good idea to do that. So the, so the, the, so the tension so the here is that we would both like to, uh, can you meet, mute Ricardo? I'm getting echo off of your mic. The, uh, the tension here is that we both want to be able to run CES in the absence of the ability to eval and also to run in the ability in, in an environment that does not have an async function constructor. And if you happen to run in both, then it's tricky. That if you're in an environment that does not allow you to use eval and also does have an async function constructor, we have to use a syntactic async function in order to discover its prototype and constructor. 
Um, I don't think that we can have both. Right. Yeah, yeah yep. I think that's a fair point. I, I, I guess you could do like some kind of uh, build time uh, magic to support, for example, one release that uh, does not support evil and then it doesn't uh, support the async syntax. But obviously that would be terribly unsafe to use in those cases where uh, oh. I think is uh, in fact supported. Uh, the problem is detecting, detecting when sets has been transpiled because that's usually a mistake. Uh, and I don't think it's possible to do that unless uh, you have eval. That's right. Mm. Uh, so async as a mm. keyword is, uh, uh, is going to break anything. So it uh, we can't put it in an if or unreachable code, so eval is the only option for us. Uh, but for the record, um, I, as a user, would be fine with having a option that I could pass to lockdown or repair uh, that simply declares uh, do not reach for uh, async functions um the problem is something of the we of don't the... have means to do that uh without eva right so which is to say that you uh, if there were a lockdown option that were named something like dunderbar i solemnly swear that the environment i know that the environment i'm running in does not support async await dunderbar I, yeah. I think i think the only option there is Well, it, well, it's not that. It's just like basically disable, yeah, disable eval, and try and 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 which implicitly means trust that um, the prototype that you're extracting through um, to an async syntax that would have been compiled or transpiled is is it's correct is what everybody else is getting because that's at the end of the day that's what is important that it, that's what is important it has to be the prototype that everybody, that everybody else is getting is getting so that we can freeze it i see jazzer's hand hey uh, isn't uh, isn't the transformation from uh, async await to promises a fairly mechanical one I don't follow. The, um, you're asking about uh, translating? Yeah. Right. During compile, you could turn every async await into a promise dot then. Um, and then you have it. I mean, it's not as efficient, I understand, but you, you yeah. no, it's It's potentially more efficient. The thing is, we need to grab the prototype of the async function, and that's a different prototype than the regular function. I, and I for that, know. we need to okay. declare an async function. You need to. I don't understand that. Say, say the, that. The, the, wrong thing the, the async that. function, the async function prototype is not reachable by property traversal from global this it's not a global the, so in order to get a reference to think generator and which which is undeniable and if you are evaluating arbitrary javascript um you have to use async function syntax and it's not the user that needs the prototype it's the lockdown that needs to freeze the prototype uh, I see. Uh, do Do you have a place to stand to do translation? Or I I don't yeah. think you do, right? Oh, you do. Well, we have a place to stand is for transforming CES itself. We do not have a place to stand for transforming guest code. Guest code. Ah, got it. Got it. Got it. Okay. We are in a position to censor guest code. We can we we can forbid the use of async await, <laughs> but but we would rather not. Wait, so where, 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 where are you able to do that? Before the code is evaluated, you are able to examine the code. 
we're yes, we're in a position for any code that we evaluate to look at the text. And so, you have a you, you have a parser available to you. We do not entrain a parser, and we must not entrain a parser for performance reasons. Not just performance reasons. The um the the reason the we want to make sure that our security does not depend on a parser for JavaScript being accurate because it's too hard to parse JavaScript accurately and there's too much of a history of security exploits sneaking in and the difference between what the parser parses, what the you know what, what a JavaScript based parser parses and what the machines parser, what the, what the machines JavaScript parser parses. This, this, this feels, this brings back memories. Let's go with that. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Those memories. Yeah. Um, I, so I uh, th th think that we're at an impasse for the moment and probably ought to just think about it for a little longer. The, uh, the, but the options going forward are for this specific use case that you could legitimately state you could legitimately say that you have deployed a React Native application. You know exactly which version of JavaScript is of Hermes is going to is entrained by that application. You know that it's not going to evolve to have async await uh, on on <laughs> underneath your feet. I, I want to question a pre previous assumption. You yes. said we don't want to censor async await. If we're in this configuration, why doesn't it make sense to just add another regex sensor to say reject the program if it had just has the identifier async or await? We could. It would have a lot of false positives. Yeah. It would have uh, false positives, tens of false positives per uh, bundle because uh, a lot of that would come from uh, the result of building the whole thing where a lot of phrases containing async uh, remain in comments uh, or in names of functions for tooling that pretends to be async. Would it be acceptable to introduce an evasive transform? Um, acceptable, but expensive. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. E expensive to the developer of the transform or exp expensive to build the transform and so i mean it wouldn't be a regex transform it would be a, an yes. actual ast involving transform and it would probably have a lot of work to do uh on an already uh big uh bundle file why okay. why wouldn't we it don't be a regex to... transform Um, we would need to distinguish the cases where async appears in strings. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so th that's so, the same as, so as for import, though, right? Oh, it sorry. is the same as import. It is. It is. It is. It. Uh, and and we perhaps aren't doing enough on import uh, for evasive transforms either. Yeah. Uh, time check. It is. I, mm -hmm. I, I am trying to wrap this, Dan. <laughs> the, um, the, we're halfway in, and we have two demos we'd like to show, and I think that. Yeah. We need to continue to have this conversation um, in a subsequent week. Um, yeah, uh, uh, I don't recall who I said goes first. Oh, yes, I do. It was Dan. Dan, please regale us with a demo. You're muted. Well, that sucks. <laughs> uh... This project goes back to, I've been tracking my finances on software I wrote since 1986, always fun. Um, and it's kind of a mashup, which is a little scary doing finance stuff. So um, Endo is supposed to help with scary stuff. Um, and so Endo apps, I'm learning how to write them. They at the edges, like anything else, you have to reach out into the world and do use scary stuff. Um, and so um, I have a, there's a thing called GNU Cache, which is a, a personal finance software. And fortunately it's uh, migrated to, to support SQLite 3 a little few years ago. So I have a whole bunch of data in SQLite 3. 
And then there's a service I use that inter you know, integrates with Google Sheets. So I'm using that. And then um, to access the Google Sheets, I'm actually storing some stuff in the uh, desktop secrets database. You know, it's keychain on a Mac on, on Linux. It's, it's called the secret service or something like that. So um, I made these three plugins. One's called database tool. Um, and the idea of these things is they're supposed to be Polish shaped. So you can say, okay, given one of these authorities, give me the read only version of it, or give me the version for just the one table or something like that. I haven't done that really thoroughly. This is real rough demo stuff. Um, so that's one for the SQLite database. Then there's the secret tool thing. Um, and you can get sort of access to the whole secret service or there, or it has this sort of attribute based structure to it and you add more structure, more attributes and that allows you to reach fewer entries. Um, she can make a sub key. And then there's the sheets tool. And the only thing I've done here is just accessing the spreadsheet with a dot read only thing. Um, and you put those together and um, I guess I could show you the, a little bit of the code of the plugins if you wanted to, but um, uh, the default make target just tells you where your endo state is. Make clean does an endo reset. Does anybody here not know what an endo reset is? All right. Nobody's being honest. I All don't right. know what it is. There you go. <laughs> so endo has got a command line. Uh, interface and then it has a daemon that runs in the background and it has this uh, storage stuff that it stores in, on, on Linux. It stores it in dot local slash state and endo reset um, basically deletes everything inside of lo the local state and it might start and stop the daemon. I forgot. And then um, I'll go ahead and run the demo. I'll switch demo. Let's see. Mm. Why is it not letting me pick this window? All right. Um, one moment. Move to, come on. <laughs> All right. Is anybody seeing a VS Code stuff? VS Code is visible. All right. So make just tells you where the stuff is, make clean, blows it all away. Uh, and then make the web version of it I added, sorry, make sync. It's the one that does the non-trivial stuff. I added some new lines in the web version of it. Um, but so, okay, so it with these plugins, um, oh, so the first thing the make file does is um, make it a, a confined sync tool. So there, this is loaded in a, um, a sort of zero privilege uh, endo compartment. That's the sort of main program. And that makes a sync tool. Um, we also instantially instantiate the SQLite um, database tool. And for that, you have to say unsafe. And then uh, choose a SQLite database. And so I'm using that one. Uh, look up the path in the database hub. Oh, so this is just a string constant here. And then to actually choose, you know, combine the database plugin with that file name, we go here. And so then we get an actual tool for that database. Instantiate the secret plugin. So then we get a secret tool. Then we're going to make a pass key for this particular Google sheet. So there's a um, some stuff that I've already put in the secret store. And then this is the ID of my sheet. And so it's going to make a um, a pass key for just that sheet. So there it is. Um, and then it's going to instantiate the Google Sheets plugin. There it is. 
And then using that Google Sheets plugin, load the secret item to get access to it. And there we go. And then it says push uh, GNU Tash transactions to Sheet Sync. It actually computes the transactions that it would, would push. Um, doesn't do that yet, but so it reads from the database, finds a bunch of things that are not categorized, goes and looks in. Um, uh, oh, and then it, it pretends like it's pushing those up to the to the um, to the Google Sheet, which is something I've implemented, but not inside of Endo. So there's 343 transactions that it's all set to send to the to the Google Sheet, and that's how far the prototype goes. That's the demo. Very cool. While uh, while you were running through this, it occurred to me that we ought to add an and it, it would be an interesting idea to add an endo import and export command so that you could dump and import all of the underlying formulas for a particular pet name so that they could be moved from one daemon to another. That would make mm -hmm. that might make it possible to do some interesting things. Is there anything else that's interesting to do at this point? Endo. Anyway. Well, so what I take away from this demo is that there are a few pluggable components that might be reusable for other use cases. And I think, I think that that's the neat thing about the pet demon in this regard is that each of these little things that you need, these unsafe things for like reaching out to your keychain or, um, or using SQLite 3, these are reusable components for other interesting orchestrations of, um, of your authority as a user. Right. The one other thing that occurred to me was kind of interesting about this is a certain amount of stuff goes into the Endo database, but the, the secret does not. Mm -hmm. The secret gets looked up at runtime each time, so which is kind of fun. Yeah, it seems like a good property. Well, I imagine that we'll want to have a secret store plugin that has a a common API, regardless of what platform you're standing on. That'd be really handy. Mm -hmm. Um, Aaron, are you ready to go? Yes. Okay. You see your screen? Familiar shot. Cool. <clears throat> All right. So um, I was playing with the uh, familiar shot uh, demo <laughs> that Chris had thrown together and just um, uh, kind of learning about the system by playing with it. So this is a pretty rudimentary demo, but hopefully it will stimulate some, some conversation. Uh, I've run this command on the left to uh, get this little web app guy running. Um, and I made some uh, changes to the the web app, as you'll see in a moment. Um, OK, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to make this little uh, Tamagotchi uh, thing that I came across. And I'm going to call it Meowzer. Um, so I'm creating this thing. And it has shown up inside of my inventory here. Oh, uh, one, one change I made is that I'm you know running a two string on each object in my inventory. Um, and then I've also created um, a optional sort of like render uh, um, rendering space. So you can, um, the, the UI here will call in, call a method like display text or something on each of these objects. And if it doesn't, if it, it'll just throw away an error if that, if it doesn't have that um, uh, method and otherwise it will display the text content. Uh, and then additionally, it also can ask if it has, uh, if each uh, facet has a, an interface it wants to display. Um, and so here uh, we have a little Meowser guy and we can, you know, we can like feed him. Oh, he's a little happier now. We can, uh, you know, run these different commands to take care of our little uh, Meowser. Um, but there's, you know, there's a lot of uh, different things to do and it's not really clear what's, uh, what's uh, improving his state of mind. 
And so I uh, would like to install uh, this pet therapist. Help me understand what's going on with Meowser. Uh, so first I have to make this, uh, this guest, this agent. This is like where the powers, uh, this is going to hold the powers that the therapist guest, therapist gets. Um, so there we've created this container. And now we're going to uh, make the, the pet therapist. Uh, we'll name it therapist and we'll give it the powers of the therapist agent. Okay, um, and as our therapist uh, booted up, it made a request for a pet to analyze. Um, and we're going to, um, so the way the UI works right now, we would type in the name, our name for the facet. Um, but uh, if this this uh, begs, uh, how should we uh, do types and how should we talk about interfaces? Because if this thing could say like, oh, I need a, uh, I need something with a Tamagotchi interface, we can do a drop down of all of our things that declare to have a Tamagotchi interface and and make them uh, a selection. Uh, for now, we just have to type in the name. So I'd like to come back to that topic of types and interfaces. Um, cool. So I will now give the therapist uh, the pet it wanted. We can get rid of that notification now. And now we can see our therapist has given us a report on our pet um, and all of its needs. Um, and we see it's really low on esteem, so we can reassure uh, is that the right one? Nope. Uh, we can uh, compliment our kitty cat in that. Um, that was good, but it didn't give us really what we want. It needs some love and belong belonging. So let us... Um... <laughs> I don't remember how this works. Okay, we can pet it, and then we can see its mood is improving significantly. Um, and now it has reached its final form. It's full, fully happy. <laughs> um, so yeah, this, this is just a simple demo of showing how different uh, guests and um, facets can interact with each other and what do we want to like have this set interface kind of thing uh, for triggering common actions within facet. Um, do we want some kind of display? Do we want to just give them an iframe and let them render the interaction themselves? Do we, what, what is an inventory screen? What, what would we expect to see there? Um, and then uh, the other discussion topic is again, like how do we want to um, deal with types and interfaces and that sort of thing? Um, desktop drag and drop is kind of, comes to mind. What was that? Is Unless you're on mobile, drag and drop is sort of an, an, an obvious idiom to introduce one widget to another. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, that certainly works. Um, but I think it would, uh, including that system, we'd be able to give a um, you know visual feedback, say when you're uh, hovering over the drop, of whether or not there was a um valid like response right. handler for that type or something like that so being able to describe an interface um would be useful i'm sure there's some prior art here what is it there, yeah there is a bunch of prior art um the and yeah and and how many of the mistakes of the past we wish to recapitulate versus do a little slightly better on is an open question too. Um, there, there are sort of two levels to this. Um, one of which is that the pet demon itself has a limited inventory of types that it knows about because it has formula types and there's an qu open question of what, whether those correspond to things that are useful to convey to the user and whether it's sufficiently extensible. Um, I think that the answer in general to those questions is like, there might be something useful, but it, it would be like the distinction between built-in types and classes and JavaScript. Um, the, the much more interesting question is, can a, uh, can an 
a, a capability advertise its interface in an interesting way to the user um, and can uh, and and if it does advertise is how um, how much liberty do we give it to lie mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and uh, so I think it's it's, it's there 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 it's interesting that some objects may be able to suggest that they would be suitable for communication between two different things. I think that it probably has to be something like here are some unique identifiers for the interfaces that I claim to satisfy that can be used as a helpful hint, but not authoritative um, for the user interface to be able to provide some hints about. I, it, it would, in, for example, in the in the request that we had for a uh, for a pet to analyze, when the therapist asks for a pet to analyze, um, I think the ideal outcome would be that you would get a drop down box that could be drop uh, could be a drop target as well um, for initially. It was like it, where you could provide any of your pet named objects. It could be even like a, a, a token field where you can just start typing the name of the thing that you want to drop there um, so that it could be auto completed. But the, but it perhaps there are recommendations for here are the things that advertise that they are a good fit for this slot um, in terms of your pet names for, for those, for those interfaces. If you happen to have one, I see Jazz's hand. Uh, so two, two questions about that idea, um, uh, both down in the weeds. Uh, one is, it used to be the case that if you dragged and dropped a thing before, before the membrane had a chance to execute, the browser would execute things. So you, if you dropped an HTML blob, uh, 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 script tags on the in the blob would get to execute. I don't know whether that's still true or not. That was insane, but that was that used to be the case, which is something worth checking. Uh, the other is uh, positively, who cares if they lie about the interface? Because uh, if you don't have the functions exposed that you would call, then well, not, not nothing will happen, right? Yeah, this is uh, right. Yeah, the uh, it, it, you, and yeah, as as Dan mentions in chat, that we have the distinction of alleged type versus actual type, and we're very very visible, as you can see under Meowser, that Tamagotchi alleges it's that it is a Tamagotchi. Um, um, well, the point I was trying to make about was about patterns. We have get alleged interface, and we have interface patterns, but is get alleged interface eventually supposed to return the interface pattern or is it always supposed to be a string? The, there, uh, the, Mark, Mark, I can, ahead. I can answer. I can answer. <clears throat> the, the, there's for all exos, which are the things that have the supported interface pattern. Uh, there's already an added method with a symbol name, where the symbol name is symbol dot four uh, get interface guard, and it actually returns the entire interface guard containing all of the method guards with all of the argument patterns. Uh, the the interface guards, the whole guard and pattern system, was designed so that all of those objects are passable. Uh, indeed, they are all passable, and uh, exos already support such a query. Um, the string, uh, the reason why the string is alleged is that it's, it arrives immediately with a presence and there's a third party veracity problem, which is if Alice, um, uh, if Alice on that A on chain A uh, or, you know, on platform A um, sends to Bob on platform B, uh, a message containing a reference to Carol on uh, on um, to Carol on platform C. Uh, the problem is that the presence, when it arrives uh, on platform, the, pl the presence for Carol when it arrives on platform B, already has the alleged interface name 
according to what was serialized by platform A. So the alleged is, is, is not because you're not trusting Carol to allege her own interface. Uh, that it's certainly the case that Carol could lie, but that's just sort of the normal thing about uh, you ask an object and the answer you get back is according to the object. The, 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 th the reason why we mark the, the interface name in the presence with alleged is because it's less trusted than that. It's that the, the allegation about Carol is coming from Alice, it's coming from platform A, it's not coming from platform C. Uh, and that can be repaired if you're willing to wait for a round trip uh, because at the cost of a round trip, you can just ask Carol uh, for the for the string in the that the alleged pet therapist is coming from. Where we can't wait for the round trip, but the get interface guard message is a genuine message, and you only get it by doing a round trip to Carol. Mavis, did you use get interface guard to get? No, I I reinvented it. Okay. Which is fine because I, Kamavis is also not using exos yet. Um, that uh, and and I and I don't know how how far along how close are we to being able to use exos in the the pet demon. I think that 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 amounts to having a heap zone and some other stuff that we haven't finalized. Uh, heap zone's fine. The heap zone exists. It's in endo. It's finalized. What do you mean? That was, that was just last time I talked to Michael. About it, I I wasn't sure whether it was ready yet. Oh oh oh! The you don't have to use the heap zone. You can just use the the make heap exo. You can just use the the heap the heap exo makers that are already. You're right. The heap zone is not finalized, but the 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 support methods, the things for just making uh, heap exos, those are are well supported and have been in there for a long time now. Yeah, so we could start. We could create an example. To, to riff off of as a um, a way to upgrade these far. Uh, and currently, we're using far. We could provide an example of how to use make heap exo instead yep. with an space guard. In any case, what the, the germane bit is that the uh, the interface that oh pardon a fighter jet's about to fly over my house. I went a different way. Okay, cool. Uh, the, um, the the germane bit is that we could uh, it, we could filter or prioritize or sort um, pet names from your pet store based off of uh, what interfaces are what what the, you could in your request for a pet named object state the inter the the interface that you want and then also and then the, the your pet names could be filtered in that drop down or the select box. Um, I think that that's interesting. I think it's also um, it would also be interesting to have a more user level way to identify and hint at what interfaces need to be uh, transferred between two particular messages, um, and that might that could just be um, having metadata on pet names or metadata on formulas for uh, these are these are interfaces that the, have been a, a, a ascribed to this either by the originator or out of band. It's also pretty possibly crazy to think about just sort of generalized user interface patterns outside the context of a, of a sort of app. It's like the, was it open doc and a few of those things, you know, people tried to do those and the only one that survived was the web. <laughs> Yeah. So the other the other topic. Thank you for bringing that up. Is that in addition to having get interface, we could have other conventional methods for the pet demon, so that it, it can interrogate it for not just that kind of thing, but also, hey, this is an object that has a a that a weblet was designed for for viewing and interacting with this object. Um, so uh, let's just open that in a weblet. <laughs> Another open up another page to interact with this object, or uh, iframe or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Which would be well within the design space. <laughs> if I guess you had a little UI for your cat there, 
Did you know about weblets at all? Come on, this. Well, I guess the whole thing is running into weblet, if I'm not mistaken. It um, is. But uh, I did not know. Here, I was just like, I just wanted to do an emoji. So I just yeah. made a little text rendering spot. Yeah, it's a good place to start. And and what I want, yeah, what I want to do here is to make it, uh, it, it, in, in order for what I'd like to have, in order to drive the user experience that I'm hinting at, uh, the daemon needs to expose some sort of open function on the powers facet that you get um, that corresponds to the make uh, to to the to the endo open command at the CLI. There was also that um, demo with replacing objects with what were they iframes or something? Um, am I ringing enough bells? There was a. Uh, um, Michael did a prototype of a of an extension, a web extension mm -hmm. that uh, was able to transclude objects in a in a in a in a in a web like a conventional web page with um, and that was for transcluding pet names in particular. It no, is one of the benefits there was the surrounding pet surrounding page didn't really know what pet name you had assigned yeah that that's the idea and we discussed that last week uh jazz uh, uh, mentioned tartans as uh something to look into for ways to distinguish a permissioned element surrounded by unpermissioned content so that it would be um distinguishable from fake permissioned content yeah that sounds tricky <laughs> yeah <laughs> Um, that's a, yeah, that in general, that's a tricky problem, especially if we generalize it to here's, here's a sandboxed iframe that you can render anything into the things of, like the shape of the shape of the rendered content in there can leak information about what's contained. If the user gets to choose a pet color <laughs> and the app can't know what the color is, then I can use put dancing, dancing ants of that color around all these things. Anyway. Yeah, I have yeah, I haven't gotten any yeah, dancing hats. Exactly. I think the <laughs> dancing hats is, is exactly here. Jazz, Jazz used the keyword tartan, which I think means that someone has thought of this. <laughs> um, and I, I still need to go do some searching for what uh, what's up with that. But the name implies, yeah, exactly. Here, here's my brand of dancing ant so that I, I know exactly. I know that this part of the page came from my brand of dancing ant. And then the other, like Firefox introduced the idea, the idea of Chrome, <laughs> and the idea of Chrome being that that permissioned outside of the web page, which, which which conveys to the user the sense that if you have, if there's some piece of, if you can see something that overlaps the Chrome of the surrounding browser, that implies that it's coming from a, a, a position of permission. And of course, iOS totally neglected that and just started rendering iOS-like user interfaces right over web pages, but for, for permission management and gosh knows what, how bad has that turned out? I, I don't know. <laughs> but uh... oh, for what it's worth, informally, I've tested the overlapping trusted UI on friends and family and it does not behave the way that I would have thought it would behave. Like, like everybody, yeah, it does not behave the way that I would have thought. I, I, I thought that it would be obvious to people that like, if you're overlapping, then like, this is trusted. Uh, only trusted UI can do this. And uh, at, at least amongst my friends and family, and it's, it's a very small sample set, but like, no, nobody, I don't know how to do trusted UI is basically the short answer. I don't know how anyone can do trusted UI. Yep, you're in good if, company. If you figure it out, let me bring all of your attention to the Norm Hardy prize being run by um, <laughs> yeah. by Foresight. I, I, I saw that, that's beautiful. Uh, I think that that's a prize that's gonna be open for a while. Well, it, it's a prize for progress. You don't have to figure out the whole thing to get the I, prize. I, 
All right, we're coming up on the hour. We've had a couple great demos and a great conversation that we will all we will have to continue um, in a subsequent week. Um, so some things to talk about in the future are how to win the Norm Hardy Prize for definitively solving permission to user interfaces. <laughs> And, uh, and also we need to talk about what to do and uh, what to do about um, armies. I All think right. that the sense censoring the, oh yeah, I was, I was actually, um, do we have another minute or two? We have two. Okay. Um, so actually we don't, it doesn't help to uh, censor await. We have to censor async is the issue. Um, and async can only be used uh, with a small number of following possible tokens, correct? In its, in its legitimate use. So, mm -hmm. so in terms of detecting a violating use of async. It's not just the async identifier. You could, we could be somewhat more narrow than that to still be safe. Yes, somewhat. Uh, async oh. followed by an identifier, async followed by an asterisk, async followed by an open parenthesis. Yeah, yeah. And in fact, and with the identifier case, if that's too many false positives, it's an identifier followed by an arrow. Wait, hold on. What? Oh, identifier for, uh, yeah, for the arrow less, for the parenthesis less uh, arrow function, right? Right. Oh, and I'm wrong about the asterisk. We never, we never got arrow syntax for async right. generators. Wait, a, 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 async, async and identifier semicolon is, is an error? No. Yes. yes. Wait. Well, no, it's not an error. It's it's just not an async function. It's not an async function, but it is valid, right? Uh, valid no. Is, yeah, valid is what? Hey, what would what it would what would it be valid as? What would it mean? It would return the it would return the it would return the right hand side as a value. You're, you're thinking of a weight, not async. Oh fuck! You are right. Yes, I'm thinking of a wait. Okay. Yeah, async can only be used to declare functions. Yeah. But um, yeah. there's a lot of overlap because you can have async uh, left paren, an arbitrarily long sequence, a right paren, and then you only know if that's a function call versus a uh, uh, a concise function declaration based on what follows the closing paren. Or, yeah, so we can have really many nested brands, and it's like, yeah, yeah. For the sensor, I would just say, uh, if it's fo if async followed by an open paren, that's adequate to sensor. We're just trying to reduce the the false positives uh, to a tolerable level, and we're not going to know what's tolerable until we try. Yeah. Uh -huh. So basically, we need to. Uh, so ZB is proposing that we add a mode for Hermes to lockdown mm -hmm. in which we do or do not, we do have a eval or do not have eval. Uh, no, we do not have both eval and uh, async. Support. Okay. And in this mode, we need to, we need to, to do better than trust the caller of lockdown that they have prepared an environment that lacks eval and async. And the thing we were displaying that was uh, complaining about async was not at runtime. So Hermes is taking JavaScript and compiling it in some way, uh, which leads to it uh complaining at that stage so, right. so we have to eliminate the use of syntactic yeah. async throughout sess in order to semantically this is more like censorship than anything else yeah but it, yeah. it does have yeah. uh generators or does not i would hope so well, uh, i didn't check 
Uh, do you okay. have function constructors? We need um, to check. Yeah. You have function them. Function constructors are there. Work. I assume that you have them, but they cannot be used for eval. But uh, then in that case, uh, maybe you don't even need to do anything to the prototypes because if they are not usable for eval, then there's little harm so if, they, around. if they're present and mutable, then they can be used yes. for communication. And reachable, if they're, if they're reachable. If you, can't, if you cannot utter the syntax, you can't reach them. Right. What I was getting at here is like, presumably they have uh, generators and so they have the generator function prototype. Um, I believe that currently in CES, those also are accessed through eval and they would have to be just assumed in this mode that that syntax is valid. I think CES, I think, I mean, the old, the old SE5, um, uh, the old ES5 CES for, that I did at Google uh, was using eval, I think maybe even for generators because it came in with, with um, uh, ECMAScript 5, which was pre-generators. But the, uh, you know, the, our, our CES, I don't think it, I think it assumes, I, I don't think it's using eval to probe whether generators exist. I think it's just using generator syntax directly. I can confirm both. Okay, mm -hmm. I mean, in that case, it's, it's fine. So we would not use it for async and we're already using the, the newish syntax for generator. Yeah. Yeah, generators are really old. <laughs> yeah, older on some browsers than others. But, but so is with. Um. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah, with, with and eval have been around for a long time. <laughs> Touche. Uh, Hermes not supporting with uh, seems like a complexity decision. They said that they are willing to implement with. It's just uh, very challenging. They would have should, to touch we... a lot of places. Yeah, we should tell them that if, if you implement compartments, we won't need with. Yeah, that's that's my plan, but we have to build a better relationship to have their attention long enough to explain compartments. Yeah. Do they do they completely omit sloppy mode? Uh, I think so. I think so. Last that's time awesome. Heard. Yeah. Uh I'm I'm gonna ask my question. Hey Mark. Uh Remember that Sriram Krishnamurthy and Co had a translation for with into Oh yeah. How, yeah. How, how excuse my language, but how the fuck does that work? But does that oh, mean that, that we can does that mean that we can do the cess with the nested with the translation? The translation was very invasive. I mean, it was a very simple translation. But like it, it was it a, meant, but a global translation. It was a global translation. You basically had to take every free variable in the evaluable script, every free variable, and translate it into something that was a conditional expression. I see. Okay. So that that that's that's what okay. Okay. And and we don't want to do that in CES. We don't want to do translation of that kind. We don't want to be pausing. Right. Yeah, Turing says Tur Turing says that if you're willing to do a complete source source transformation, you can do anything. I have not chatted with that Turing guy in a long while. All right. Yeah. All right, folks. That's a. It's been a good one. See oh, one more thing, Chris, with regard to the name for this mode, the Hermes tolerant mode. We yeah. we will all depend on you to make some obscure Greek god pun. I mean, hermetic is kind of obvious. Oh. it's 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 like ideally, 
ideally Hermes would actually provide lockdown and confinement and compartments in order to legitimately complain in, in order to legitimately claim to be hermetic hermit mode i saw that go by in the chat that's good <laughs> yeah i i don't think that that's uh i i don't think that that's an um i i think that that it, that i don't think those are false friends i think that hermit and hermes are probably cognate <laughs> But I'm going to look that up. <laughs> do, do you know about Hermetic? Is that the are they false friends? What there's something called Hermetic? Yeah, like hermetically sealed. Yeah. Yeah. Are yeah. they are they false friends or is it derived from Hermes? Oh, her Hermetic is definitely derived from Hermes. Hermes, yes. Oh, 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 I, for for me, Hermit being potentially derived from Hermes is the is the thing that I never thought of that is yeah yeah that's the plausible etymology that I'm going to look up I I have a sort of fun relationship with plausible etymologies it's like every time I find one and it turns out to be wrong I get to post it to my mailing list that I found a plausible etymology that was wrong which makes me happy and it makes me very sad when the etymology actually makes sense <laughs> I, I would like to subscribe to your newsletter. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> um, I apologize in advance. <clears throat> Everyone's favorite standard reference says no. It says no? Yeah. From Eremia, uh, solitude, uninhabited region, a waste. Oh. oh, I wasn't going to do anything else, so I'm going to join you in searching while on this call. <laughs> Definitely not wasting time right now. <laughs> At least we got it recorded. Uh, it's a uh, recording's over. <laughs> uh, let's see. Yeah, Hermes. <laughs> okay, Hermetic. Zoom says it's still recording. Oh, it is. <laughs> Brilliant. I will cut and, and post two different videos. <laughs> mm. uh, you can A, B test them. Okay, so Hermetic is from Hermes. Hermit, recluse, Aramedia, Aramedes, person of the desert. Oh, okay. So I do have a plausible etymology post coming on, but it'll have to wait because I have a note to myself that I need to do a thing about how dials are come from digital. Wait, say that again. Uh, the word dial plausibly comes from the omission of the inner letters of digital or digital. <laughs> uh, certainly, yeah. It's not like sundial is a redundant word. I, I, I did not try to learn any amount of Latin until I was an old an, an older person. And then I realized how helpful it is to work out meanings of words I do not know because you can make fairly good guesses. It, yes. It's also helpful to know all of the other dead languages for what it's worth. Uh, <laughs> um, one of my first, I, I, with, with my friend group, we worked out that a whole bunch of things that have, but that there are a whole bunch of actually used words across all the way from English to Thai that, that, tr that have shared roots like, uh, like wit wit in English is cognate with withya in Hindi and withisar, which is science in Thai. And <laughs> so like wizard uh, is in there too. Of course, wizard is, all, the, the suffix is also shared with drunkard and apparently supposed to be equally disparaging. That's fun. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, the other one was um, I, I, uh, asan through Sanskrit, 
is cognate with ocean. Wait, what, what is the Sanskrit? Uh, asana or asana. Oh, oh yes. Okay. Uh, asana. It's yeah. cognate with ocean um, because they both lay down. <laughs> it's <is> so great. <laughs> um, yeah. There was a Perl module called uh, Lingua Romana Perligator, which uh, yeah. which was a source to source translator uh, that that let you write programs in Latin. Uh, what was I, I that, remember that was, this? That was beautiful because you know you you suddenly learn like a whole bunch of ways of creating arrays just with suffix and variables, and that that was. <laughs> I don't I, I don't think I knew enough of the tiny bit of Latin <laughs> to fully appreciate Paralegata. <laughs> I, I, I think that I ended up reading about Latin only after Perligata came out because it was like, wait, this is something that I really need to understand better. Um, I don't remember I uh, whether they did all of the versions of and like um they I believe they did, yes. So you could use et in infix and you could use k in suffix and eh, yeah. and, and, and uh, whatever Perl six adopted a whole bunch of those from Perligata because Conway was involved in the creation of Perl six. This is before Roku was a thing. <laughs> <laughs> this is fun, but I gotta go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll watch the recording. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Yeah, I'm wondering whether where the K suffix, but the K suffix definitely had to be, would have to bind tighter than the et infix. Uh, so good. So you could do all of the BS that you normally do in Perl with, with the same operator at uh, varying levels of precedence. <laughs> I have uh, two Perl modules on the uh, on the uh, on the CPAN. Uh, one of which is uh, a Perl to Perl compiler that turns every Perl program that you have into an equivalent Perl program that has no alphanumerics, uh, um, and one that turns any Perl program that you have into pictures that are executable. Um, those were my two contributions to the world. I, I'm still very Probably. proud of. Yeah, I'm I'm sure that I have seen a number of the pictures that were generated with your tool. <laughs> I'm sure. Uh, <laughs> uh, I I, uh, I was a really really big fan of. Um, oh, what was the name of the site? Why am there was a site that had the ninety nine bottles of yeah it was ninety nine bottles of beer oh. or something like that. Yeah yeah yeah. That yeah. that definitely was one of the ones that was generated using my using my uh, using my tool because that was actually the writer <laughs> sure. that I had. <laughs> it For was <laughs> it would self modify the the GIF code so that when you executed the GIF it would print out the stanza and then modify itself uh, so that the GIF did not have one of the 99 bottles anymore it would have 98 bottles so it would generate the picture this is a different thing i'm just thinking of the pearl program that was rent that rendered as beer bottles non-alphamerically <laughs> yeah then then played out 99 bottles of beer the song lyrics when when executed i don't think that it works anymore i checked recently the pearl must have broken something it's unsurprising We've all been burned before. Um, yeah. Okay. I got to go. Yep. Yeah, likewise. Good to see y'all. Thanks, everyone. Bye.